Good afternoon and welcome to a webinar as part of a three-part series by the National Genetics Education and Consumer Network. The webinar today is entitled Empowering Individuals and Families as Advocates, the Advocacy Atlas. Um, during today's webinar, we're going to show you some new tools and also hear from some of our expert partners on this topic. As a reminder, all participants are in listen-only mode. What that means is that you can't speak on your phone or microphone, but we definitely want to hear from you. So please type any questions that you have uh, into the uh, question panel on the right-hand side of your screen uh, during the webinar. You can send us questions, and then during the Q&A session at the end, uh, we will answer those questions and pose them to our presenters. Also, if you do have any questions after the webinar, you can always email us and ask us those questions, and we're happy to connect you to the right people. So with that, I'm going to let Sharon Ramelchek, uh, Program Manager here at Genetic Alliance, introduce the webinar and the tool. Uh, my name is James O'Leary. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer with Genetic Alliance. Thank you very much for joining us. Great, thank you. And like James mentioned, this webinar is brought to you by the National Genetics Education and Consumer Network. I just wanted to give you a little background on this initiative and our work with Parent to Parent USA and Family Voices, and then I'll pass it over to our speakers. And as you can see here, the goal of NGECN is to form a collaborative network of partnerships and accessible tools that will improve access to and knowledge about genetic services for consumers as well as, as well as improve the quality of those services. So what do we mean by consumer? We use this term for the purpose of this initiative to mean individuals who utilize genetic services in their families. This can include individuals diagnosed with a genetic condition, at risk for a genetic condition, and their families. Many of our resources are not limited to individuals with conditions of a genetic nature, such as the Advocacy Atlas, which aims to empower individuals with all special health care needs in their families. Most of our other initiatives do focus primarily on genetic services and public education around genetics. On this slide, you can see a list of NGECN's program objectives. I won't read them all, but the key words are highlighted in red. And our activities focus on consumer engagement, improving access to information, services and resources, new partnerships, and public education. And our close relationship with Parent to Parent USA and Family Voices has been extremely valuable because we share many of the same objectives. And by combining our forces, we're able to reach and empower a larger network of individuals and families. And as you can see on the next slide, part of our mission is to empower individuals. And we do this through connecting individuals with services and support, and by making information and tools easily accessible such as tools on communication skills and leadership that will help in everyday situations and improve access. And we hope you'll see that in today's webinar. So without further ado, I will pass it on to Gina Poli Money, who is the director of Utah Family Voices within the Utah Bureau of Children with Special Health Care Needs. And she'll share her story about why advocacy matters. Gina? Thank you. So as slide one says, Life happens, which equals to advocacy happens for our families. The word advocacy can bring many different visions depending on one's own experiences. It is out of the quality of life or even survival for our children that some of us learned exactly what it is, what it means, and how important it is. Advocacy can be as simple as asking your local grocery store to stock a favorite item that they haven't had in the past, or it can be as powerful as not allowing a nuclear waste site in your community. Some even think of the individuals they have seen chain themselves to a tree in efforts to save a forest or an environmental issue. Regardless, it is speaking through words and actions about something that is vitally important to us as individuals. For my family, it has meant advocating for life itself, how to live it, and unfortunately even how the end of life would be. As a young adult, I, I too dreamed about my future, getting married, having children, going to Disneyland, etc., and planned on using my acquired knowledge from school, inclu including that from my economics classes about how to save and build my financial stability by working hard and saving which basically translated to me in the house with the white picket fans with kids laughing and playing, the neighborhood barbecues and 
eventually even buying that minivan. But like all other extraordinary families like mine, life happened. I became the mom of children with special health care needs and quickly learned that none of my school classes or college courses taught or prepared me on how to not only find the services and resources for my children, but how to even get them. My children were spectacular in so many ways that they needed help to show what I already knew. They were amazing in everything they did, just needed some extra support to accomplish what most other children and families are able to take for granted, living a full and quality life to whatever extent that meant for us. Which for us, it meant to alleviate pain and suffering and experience as much life as possible. As a kid, to get from merely surviving to, thr- to thr- sorry, surviving to thriving is a success that can't be measured because thriving in a special needs world is unique and may even be more meaningful because I learned to recognize every single success, no matter how big or how small, and we celebrated each and every single one of them. Working for those successes and celebrations started with positively finding my voice. I learned the hard way that much of what I was doing was advocating for my children, but I'm fairly sure that early on I was not a very nice or well-liked advocate because I felt like I was always fighting for what I knew was in, in my heart right for my children or actually being silent because I had doubted myself about what I did know. Here is an example of my welcome to advocacy, whether you like it or not, training. This type of training is what I experienced in learning to drive a stick shift vehicle. On my journey, I <laughs> excuse me. I could get there eventually, even though I may have stopped the car numerous times, rolled backwards into other cars who knew that you had to keep the brake on the whole time. And I even eventually pushed the car to the side of the road to have it towed because I was so embarrassed. But I did what I had to do to get to that destination eventually. The end result is what is that it was very frustrating and tiring. And figuring out how to do it effectively, I wondered why it was so hard in the beginning. One of our family's first experiences that really sticks out and still makes my heart skip quite a few beads is during some tests for my oldest child who was very medically complex and on a ventilator, We had a newly graduated professional that came into our exam room and stated that after a swallow study that she just observed, I should no longer feed him anything by mouth because if I did, I was risking his life. This came out of the blue since we had the test for other reasons. I have so many mixed feelings that I cannot even begin to explain. But what I did know was that I knew my son very well and I also knew what our life was like at home in a reality-based world, not the evidence-based world at the hospital. My son was totally ventilator dependent due to the harsh genetic disorder that he had. We were told that he probably would not survive into adulthood, but we decided to live every day as if he would live forever. He did have a formula-based diet and gave, that gave him his nutrients and minerals as well as enough calories, but his love was Coke and Cheetos, and it was one of the things that he could have some control over and show independence in, in since the disease was taking everything else away from him. I decided fairly quickly to tell this young professional that I had not, that I would not be scheduling a surgery anytime soon for a G2 because we hadn't had a problem at that point. And I also proceeded to tell her that my son was my life and I would not do anything ever to potentially harm him. And that if it did look like he was aspirating at any time, I would talk to his doctors that knew him and knew us. And we would reconsider what the best course of action was at that time would be. Little did I know then that that was called advocacy for my child. But what came next wasn't. She told me that she could not make us choose to have a G2 put in, but that it should be on my conscience that when my son was admitted into the ER with pneumonia, it would be on my shoulders, especially if he passed away. It would solely be my fault. I did not handle that well between the tears, shock, anger. My... I know that I did not use my best behavior, but to me, that was not the tragedy. Even though I was sure that I was making the right decision, 
I let her guilt me into almost making a decision that would have haunted me forever. Luckily, before I knew what the word advocacy meant, I went out of my comfort zone and asked questions, dared to disagree with a professional advice, and decided to ask my son's neurologist her opinion as she looked up at the test results. Her words were probably what helped me most become the parent, advocate, and professional I am today. She said that the young professional was doing what she had learned and was giving advice based on what textbooks, lectures, and labs had taught her and left it at that. Then she said that I knew our situation personally better than anyone and I could make the choices based on the information that was given to me, which scared me more because what if he was fast free and something terrible was to happen? I could not have lived with that at all. She reassured me that I knew him, I knew his condition, and most of all, I was his mom, which made me just as much of an expert in his care as everyone else was. The decisions that I made would be the right ones, and if indeed I let him keep eating his Coke and Cheetos, and God forbid he did ask great, then I still did not have anything to feel guilty about, because what I was providing was the quality of life for him. We never did put a G-tube in, and he spent 17 years at home on the ventilator keeping Coke and Cheetos in business and never being admitted once, luckily, for aspiration or pneumonia. As I continued to learn and grow with my advocacy skills, I appreciated knowing that advocacy means communicating, and it is definitely using assertive communication at times, but never aggressive. I also learned to respect and listen to other points of view and learn from those that don't agree because it is valuable information. Next slide. Through that, I, my top three E's of advocacy were the empowerment because it was a confidence. It was families don't know what they're supposed to know and we don't even know that we can say no. We also get some control back to make the decisions of our lives because we are the ones that will live with it and our children will live with it. And isolation through that empowerment was dis dissolved, effective, because c communication is key. And we also have the ability to have others empathize with us if our communication is effective. And again, need to be assertive but not aggressive because there's always a need to be mutually respective of everyone involved in the care of our children and individuals. Debate can lead to great discussion, new ideas, potential compromise that may lead to the very best for the child. And it enhances the understanding of both you, your family, as well as the system. And engaged. It is really the accountability. We learn, as I said before, what um, school taught me was that you learn to save and that's how you build your future. Unfortunately, when you have to utilize public health services to meet the needs of your children, that is not something that comes into play. So we um, sometimes have to learn to overpower that learned helplessness. And advocacy is not an us against them. Advocacy is speaking up because everyone needs to understand why we need what we need. And it is because we're looking for the quality of life that our children deserve. Slide three. The key tools in the key tools and skills in the Atlas, what I found was communication, leadership, and support. All ten of the topic landing areas will have excellent resources to help advocate for some of the most common needs. But to start with, it may be helpful to check out the resources collected from expert organizations and families across the country in the Advocacy and Leadership Skills link and the Communicating About Your Health link. This is especially helpful because effective communication does not come as easy when the heart is involved and our children's health and well-being are at stake. Having appropriate tools to develop and enhance our skills can only help. We can spend our extra energy on our families instead of being frustrated or pushing the car. Yes, we're still on that never-ending long journey. So in closing, I just want to say advocating effectively means showing the world that our children and families are not the problem or the cause. The system itself is the barrier. And we have the unique experience and input to help make a system that is cost-effective and works for everyone to be a participating and healthy member of our society. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Gina. And so as Gina has shown, advocacy can make 
quite a difference in the lives of children with special health care needs. And the Advocacy Atlas, which is pictured on this slide, is an online tool for individuals and families with resources for advocating. And you can see there's 10 different topic areas. I'll pull up the website as we go through the next three scenarios from the presenters and show many of the resources that can be found on the Atlas for situations in everyday life. So the next portion, we'll go through three scenarios. And for the first scenario, I'd like to introduce Marilyn Ruiz, who is the Program Director of Family Star at the Family Network on Disabilities. And she is also the mother of a child with special health care needs. Marilyn, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Would it be possible to speak up a little bit louder? Sure. There My son's name, <laughs> is that better? Yep, thanks. You're welcome. My son's name is Anil, and um, I just want to share briefly with you um, his story. And that was that at the age of two and a half years old, he was undergoing dental surgery where he was given anesthesia. Well, after 35 minutes into that surgery, his heart stopped twice. Shortly after that, he went into a coma for a little over a month. When he finally came out of that coma, led not even knowing what questions to ask, how to get involved, how to, I went to, to his neurologist and asked, is my son going to wake up? And I remember his words to this day. If I had a crystal ball, I wouldn't be doing this type of work. At that point, I felt I was frustrated, but yet again, I had to keep going for him. So it was the strength that kept me going. When he came out of that coma, he had seizure disorders. He was cortically blind. He had developmental delays of two years. His fine motor skills were not developed. His gross motor skills were not developed. It was like having an infant at two and a half years. We had to put him back on diapers, back on a bottle, and start the whole process all over again. Our family could not help us because we did not have those resources within the family. This had been a whole totally new scenario for the whole entire family. So we had to start learning, asking questions, and learning how to help our son get back into who he is. Next slide. Next slide. And like I stated, as a parent, I was totally desperate. I felt lonely. I felt that fear and, of course, blaming myself. I had gone through all the emotions that a parent could go through. Then I started to think, wait a minute, there has to be more. I started to look for those resources, that information. I attended my first conference ever um, that Family Network held and started to learn, started to find the ways of advocating. I started to talk to other families, to other parents, to find out they were going through the same things that we had just experienced. We were not alone. We're an extended great big family. We started the first support group in that very small rural town where I raised my children. Everyone kept telling us, oh, that support group won't last. It's going to fizzle out. We've had support groups before. And to this day, those meetings are still being held, and that support group is still there. The great thing about learning how to advocate is also teaching other parents, other families, getting involved, getting those resources, and teaching our children how to be self-advocates. I'm very, very proud of my son. He has struggled, but he has made it, and he is a college graduate, and he did it on his own, and I'm very proud of him with lots of support, with learning how to self-advocate, and with a strong family 
to also advocate for him. Next slide. Some of the potential resources that this atlas will give families are those skills, those advocacy and leadership skills. Getting involved as a parent. You are your child's best advocate, especially when it's a child with special health care needs. Through family voices, families have that. Building family networks, statewide parent advocacy networks, those are the wonderful things that we can get involved in and support each other. Also, the parent as collaborative leaders, University of Vermont and PACER. These are effective meeting strategies. They help define that advocacy leadership that we all as parents have. And they also have those tips for leading effective meetings. Those are the best meetings that you could ever feel welcome to are parent-led advocacy meetings because we're all there for the same thing, for what's best for our children. And they also offer those basic advocacy tools for advocacy through Family Voices of California. And I want to add that as a parent, I am strongly involved as a grandparent of 12. I'm even more involved because I have several grandchildren with special needs and had it not been for resources like this potential atlas, my son would not have made it through college. Thank you. Great, thank you. For the next scenario, I'd like to introduce Kathy Brill, who is the Executive Director of Parent to Parent USA, and she'll share her scenario of Alexa. Kathy? Hi, everyone. Well, that first day of kindergarten was a morning of learning and new experiences, not only for our family, but the other kids in the neighborhood. I knew ahead of time pretty much how this was going to play out, but needed to let it happen to create our story and strategy to convince our school administrators and school board to add a lift to the regular bus. When the little bus arrived, my older daughter, who was in the second grade, nonchalantly assumed she'd be riding this bus to school with Alexa. The driver curtly told her she was not allowed to ride this bus and had to go on the regular bus. That was the first part of the story I was about to create, the craziness and hopefully waste of money in having two buses come into the same neighborhood headed for the same destination. Next slide. First, we needed to be able to tell our story about why this should be done. We needed to learn how to clearly convey a convincing message in a specific order and deliver it confidently. We wanted to pull at their heartstrings as it being the right thing for them to do, but we also needed to be sure we were well grounded in our legal stance. We researched and collected all sorts of facts about the laws supporting kids who have disabilities or special health care needs being transported with their peers who do not have disabilities, which is covered under related services. We had to research the laws, talk to people who understood those laws, find other school districts who had done this already along with their perceptions of the pros and cons, find out how much it would cost to size bus, and if there would be a cost increase or cost savings over the course of using this bus for many years. Are you there? Yep, we're here. Okay. Uh, the best part of our story was a question asked by a neighborhood girl to her family after that first day at school. Why does Alexa have to go on a different bus? We go to the same school. Whenever I hear any comments that supported our story or helped to build our argument, we'd write it down. 
In addition, it was important for us to make connections and build relationships with those who were going to be the decision makers. But as it turned out, we discovered over time that there were several naysayers on the board that needed to be convinced. My husband and I learned all that we could about the board members who were heard to say things like, but we'll be opening a can of worms, and we can't have special needs kids puking all over our buses, etc." One of the vocal negative board members was a Rotary Club member. So my husband took that one on by finding someone who was also a Rotary member and getting involved or getting invited to their next networking event, at which time he introduced himself and made small chit chat. He did the same a couple more times with this person until a relationship was formed, at which time it, was ho it would be hopeful that it would be difficult for this board member to vote negatively against our request. My husband and I divided the naysayers and on the fencers up like this, and they became part of our strategic plan. Some might call our strategy organized stalking, but we'd rather not say that. We also made sure that we were seen as collaborative partners in this process, willing to assist them with problem solving issues that they viewed as being potentially problematic. Had we had the Atlas at that time, we would have found numerous tools to help us with our efforts. Next slide. So, the following tools are among the collection within education services and support. You might find some of these tools cross-referenced in other categories as well. Organizing information and creating an IEP, particularly slides 13 through 15, and slide 17, the art of negotiation, which reminds us to be prepared, check our tempers at the door, and to help find solutions, etc. The art of collaboration and negotiation, creating agreement, conflict resolution, collaborative problem solving. Slide 11 would have been particularly useful to help us think through all the positions and interests involved. Rights law to learn more about transportation as a related service and the legal overlap of IDEA section 504 and the ADA. And advocating through letter writing has tons of great reminders, suggestions, and words of wisdom for ensuring our communications are accurate, clear, and well documented. Next slide. Another tool that would have served us well at the time is the Action Plans to Educate Policymakers section in the Guide to Effectively Educating State and Local Policymakers. This is located under the category of Legislation and Political Action. This chapter includes a reminder to us about our need to prepare to minimize opposition or counter arguments along with lots of templates for us to use as we fill out uh, going through our steps in creating our plan. Next slide. And last but not least, Parents as Presenters is a tool listed under Advocacy and Leadership Skills, subcategory Getting Involved as a Parent, helps to prepare parents to become presenters and share their stories effectively. So, Reinventing, or instead of reinventing the wheel, realize that many, many groups and individuals have already created tools to help you out with all sorts of advocacy issues that we face. We hope you will take advantage of the myriad of Atlas tools we've collected here during your next advocacy effort. Next slide. In the end, the board voted seven to three in favor and by November of first grade, the lift was on the regular bus, which she rode until she graduated from high school. By the way, it was quite a substantial savings to the school district to transport Alexa on the regular bus, even with the loss of seats needed to create the space for the lift. It was a lot of work, sweat, and tears, and oftentimes an emotional roller coaster. We didn't have any organized advocacy material to help guide us at that time. Had we had tools to assist us in each of these steps and help us to figure out how to move forward as we stumble through some of those steps, it would have been a lot easier, smoother, and less emotionally traumatic. Thank you, and good luck with your efforts. And now I'd like to hand this over to Bev Baker. Yes, thank Thanks you. so much, Hi, everyone. 
Uh, so my son, my now 20-year-old son, when he was eight years old um, and has a diagnosis in the autism spectrum, was signed up to go to camp in our local town. We had obtained fun, funds from a state program in order to hire an aide and gotten a, the aide hired, met with the camp officials, and thought we had done all of the prep we needed to to have Jamie participate successfully in his first camp experience. This was a camp his sister had attended previously, so we, uh, we knew the folks there and knew the camp quite well. Prior to camp starting, during a training for the camp counselors, who, by the way, were primarily uh, college-age youth, um, our aide also attended this training. The program director announced, and another side note here is that the program director was a teacher in one of the local high schools during the school year. Uh, so she announced that she did not want our son to be there, that he didn't belong at this camp, and that she'd come to camp in the summer to get, to quote, get away from kids like this. Our aide reported this to us, and after we came down off the ceiling, we called the camp administrator and arranged for a meeting with the relevant parties. That included the program director who had made the, these comments, and the assistant director, our aide, and both of Jamie's parents. Next slide, please. So the first step really, I think, in any circumstance like the one I just described at camp and some of the ones we've heard earlier, is to discover what, what is the fear, what are the concerns. In this case, what, what was the program director afraid of? Um, that gives us also then um, an opportunity to respond to the specific fears and educate them about who Jamie is and what his needs actually are. So we call, we call together this meeting, and um, one of the examples that came up uh, was their fear that he would run and leap into the lake. He was he ran like all the kids did at the beginning of camp when they were playing games. Um, and he was not a swimmer, so they were fearful that he would drown. I was quickly able to alleviate that fear, letting them know that Jamie was actually afraid of water. And we would be delighted if we could get him to jump into the water. And I wasn't concerned about his, his drowning. We had um, a full-time aide whose role was, in fact, to provide support to him, keep him safe, and help him to participate fully in the activity. So hey ben, we, sorry we to met. interrupt. Yes. Could you speak more close into the uh, phone? It's a little spotty. Hard to hear me. Yes, thank you, Sharon. Thanks. So we met, uh, we met the goal of having Jamie participate successfully. That, that two-week period went very well for him. There were concerns that, um, that continued by the camp director, and we continued to meet and uh, brainstorm with them about how to best support Jamie. Uh, we set up regular check-ins with the staff, and we also supported the aide who was, uh, was privy to hearing these concerns and seeing the way they were, they were tracking Jamie and, and trying to find problems that, you know, that would uh, be reasons for expelling him from camp. But he, never was, he was not aware of that. He had a successful two weeks and was quite delighted with his experience. The, the second goal that came out of this for us was really to assist the camp to be more welcoming to families of children with special health care needs and to provide a more positive and, and more positive and accurate information to camp counselors who were in some cases um, having their first experience as a camp counselor. And some of these young folks were going to be our future teachers. Our future program directors were going to be in roles um, in their future to interact with children, to, to children and adults with disabilities. So we wanted them to, to have a better understanding. We got through those two weeks, and at the end of the summer, we were invited by the camp administrator to join the board of the board of directors. Due to time constraints, we turned that down, but we did offer to provide um, some review and editing of a policy they were creating, which we did. And we also offered to provide an in-service each year for the incoming camp counselors about the importance and benefits of including children with special health care needs. And I should mention at this point that the program director that had um, was, was interested in our son not attending was not invited back to that camp for a second season to lead the camp activities. And this really, I think, was a good in outcome in that circumstance as we were not able to help her move beyond the bigotry that she held about children with special health care needs. So um, they got a new program director who was much more inviting to all kids. At the bottom of this slide uh, are two resources that are not yet in the atlas, but we are likely to add them. Um, and these are helpful for 
parents who are looking for a camp for the first time to learn about accreditation and to get some tips on what to look for. Next slide, please. Under um, resources that are in the Atlas, under Accessible Communities, is uh, Discover Camp, which is, um, I think, a great resource for um, new parents learning about camps and, and how to prepare their child for that first time experience. Another resource under this category, Communicating with and about people with disabilities, was created by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and is for people both new to disability advocacy, and I think it's also useful to use in training others who may not know about people first language and the importance of speaking to and about people with disabilities in a respectful manner. It's, it's not that people intend to be disrespectful, but sometimes they just aren't aware of how their language comes across. So this one pager, very easy to use, has a chart that describes language to avoid and better language to use. It gives you an alternative, um, alternative language. The next two, next two resources under advocacy and leadership skills, art of collaboration and negotiation and creating agreement, conflict resolution, and collaborative problem solving. One was developed by the Family Navigator, uh, as a Family Navigator training um, in Virginia, and the other by SPAN, which is a statewide parent advocacy network in New Jersey. Uh, these two resources are helpful guides about conflict and negotiation and I think even seasoned advocates can benefit from reminders about positive approaches and the importance of listening first. We've heard a couple of the previous speakers talk about the importance of listening. Um, when, when the advocacy event involves our own child, emotions are often very near the surface. And it's good to back up just a little bit from that and, and, and hear what the concerns are um, so that you have a better chance of of understanding where they're coming from and focusing your response. The next two items, you're an advocate for your child with special health care needs, is a one-pager that Family Voices put out, and I think we heard about this one earlier. Um, it's a good one for a new parent advocate. And Parent Leadership 101 comes also out of the SPAN network in New Jersey. Uh, provides This really, I think, is helpful for uh, family advocates who are thinking about the next step of advocacy, which um, some people move on to if they're successful, or particularly maybe when they're not successful in advocating for their child's needs, they see a need to change policies or do some systems change. And this this uh, PowerPoint presentation is useful in offering different types of opportunities to consider and tips for how to get involved. Uh, next slide, please. So we were successful with. Uh, advocacy for Jamie in terms of him having a positive experience and then use that to make some changes in our uh, in our town camp. So that was a change at a very local level in, in our town. Um, and I hope that, that that improved situations for future children who would, uh, who would later attend that camp. Uh, so that's the end of my story. Um, Kathy, are you, would you like to go ahead and talk about Parent to Parent? Sure. I'm sure many of you already know about Parent to Parent, but we've recently redone our vision and mission. And our vision is now that all children with disabilities and special health care needs grow up in a family who supports them to lead full and happy lives in their communities. Our mission is to promote excellence in parent to parent programs across the nation. And there is hope, strength, and power in connecting parents of children with disabilities or special health care needs. We have several beliefs. We believe that every parent's journey has value. We believe in the strength and resiliency of parents. We believe in the power of parents supporting one another. And we believe that support should be available to parents and families throughout the lifespan. Next slide. We have two basic um, premises. One is that we have parent-to-parent -parent support, which is promoted by Parent-to-Parent -parent USA as the intentional matching of an experienced, prepared, support parent with a parent seeking peer support and our alliance members are statewide organizations which provide support and information to families of children who have special health care needs or disabilities, most notably through parent to parent support. This model of support to families is ideal for connecting with other parents who have pursued particular advocacy efforts in hopes of finding out some words to the wise, lessons learned, 
helpful tools for the process, a good listening ear, etc. In addition, after you have had success with an advocacy effort, be sure to let your statewide parent-to-parent -parent know about your new skills so that they may match you with other parents who might be interested in pursuing that same issue at some time. It's a perfect sharing and, and pay it forward organization. Next slide. So if you'd like to get connected or learn more about us, go to our website, www.p2pusa.org. For support and information within your state, just click on looking for support and then on the U.S. map and you can find your state. But if you are in a state that does not have a statewide parent-to-parent -parent, and you or someone you know might be interested in starting one, feel free to contact me at any time. And my phone number is right there on the slide as well as my email. Okay, thank you. Bev? Thank you. So Family Voices is the organization that I work for. We are a national family-run nonprofit organization founded in 1992 uh, by families who were raising children with special health care needs. And the purpose was to activate family roles in health care. At that time, there was less, much less involvement of families in the, um, in, in the health care um, support to their children. Our mission? to achieve family-centered care for all children and youth with special health care needs and or disabilities. Next slide, please. So through our work, we're able to provide families with tools to make informed decisions. We encourage self-advocacy and empowerment in youth and young people with disabilities. One of our projects is called CASA, and that stands for Kids as Self-Advocates. Uh, I think we, we have their website on the next slide. Um, that's a... Um, you can go to that website and learn a lot. There's, there's many tools available for, for youth, and you can learn more about what CASA does. We build partnerships among families and professionals, advocate for improved public and private policies, both at a state and national level, and in, you know, in regions and local towns, like the example I provided earlier. And we serve as a trusted resource on health care. Next slide, please. The National Center for Family and Professional Partnerships, for which I am uh, co-director with Nora Wells, um, is the national center dedicated to the MCHD outcome measure, families will partner in healthcare and decision making for our children with special health care needs at all levels. We, through the NCFPP, we created the concept of family to family health information centers and pushed for their funding. They now, uh, there's now a family to family health information center in every state and in DC, so there are 51 across the country. These are family-run organizations that provide support to families in the state and focus on improving policies and practices in their state. We provide peer mentoring support and training to family leaders in every state, and we promote partnerships between families and professionals by providing tools and opportunities and mentorship. Um, on these websites, three websites are listed, the NCFTP, CASA, and the Family Voices. Um, you can go ahead and, and, and find many resources there. And if you'd like to sign up to receive our quarterly newsletter called Friday's Child, uh, you can do that on the Family Voices website um, or join, um, join as a member and be added to our listserv. There's a few other benefits as well. And I think that brings us to the conclusion of our um, our um, webinar today. Sharon, back to you. Great. Thank you so much. I want to say thank you to everyone who participated. You can hear a lot of different stories about advocacy and the role it's played. I'm going to skip this quickly and go on to talk about the next two webinars. This webinar today was really a preview to get you excited and hopefully you enjoyed learning about the Advocacy Atlas and as we prepare to launch the Advocacy Atlas, which will be hosted on the Genetic Alliance website for all who are interested. And we'll be doing a big promotion of this to make sure you know about it, you have the link, and that you are encouraged to share it with families and individuals who may be interested in the resources. And just stay tuned for our next two webinars. The, the next webinar in October will be really delving into the resources around the transition years, so healthcare transition, communicating with your provider, um, employment, education, those different topics. And then the third webinar 
will be resources on access, support, and advocacy in the health and insurance world. So I'm going to go back uh, to the contact information, but we hope that you're able to join us for the second and third webinars. So it looks like we have some time for questions. If there are any, please do send those in using the chat box. And we do have one question here um, that maybe Kathy and Bev can answer about are there resources that will be accessible to those with limited literacy skills? So will there be resources in other languages than English? Uh, this is Bev. I, I I think I heard that question um, about whether there would be resources in other languages other than English. There are some resources currently on the um, on the atlas that are in Spanish. Um, I'm not recalling other languages at this time. Uh, I don't know if Sharon or Kathy, if you remember other resources that might be in other languages. No, those that uh, I'm only familiar with um, Spanish as well. But one thing I wanted to make sure to say, and this seems to be like the perfect time to say this um, with this topic, is if you find resources out there and, and good advocacy tools, please forward them to us so that we can make sure that they're added to the toolkit. But this is a really good point to bring up because we talked a great deal about um, a diversity and being sure that we're, we're you know, meeting the needs of different cultures. So we will certainly take that into consideration as we look for additional resources. And in terms of low literacy, um, there are, are some resources, particularly in the transition section, which, uh, which, which would meet that criteria. But again, as, as reinforced what Kathy said, if you know of other resources, please do let us know. You know, and it might also be a good idea for the person that um, uh, is asking this question, if you wouldn't mind um, going through the resources, and, because I'm, I'm of the um, belief that, there, that we have a lot of resources that meets the um, literacy requirement, um, the low literacy requirement. So if you wouldn't mind looking through those and sending um, your comments to us as to which ones, perhaps we can create some sort of coding on them. Great. And I also wanted to point out, this is Sharon from Genetic Lands. When we do launch the final website, there is a prominent link on the page asking for your feedback. So we would encourage anyone to share their feedback about the resources, whether they plan to use the resources, if, you know, if they're a good literacy level, or if there's other resources out there that you can suggest. We really appreciate any and all feedback that you can give. So please, if there's any other questions, you can send those in now. We did get a question about the PowerPoint being, will it be available following the presentation? And yes, we, we are recording today's presentation and we'll make the recording as well as the slides available following the webinar. It doesn't look like we have any other questions. Bev or Kathy or Marilyn or Gina, do you have anything else you'd like to follow up with? No, I don't think I do. No, I'm all set. I just wanted to say thank you so much to the presenters because we know that we a lot of these resources were developed by other organizations and submitted and we created such a great tool, but we couldn't have done it without the Parent to Parent and Family Voices Network. So we're happy to have you as partners, and we're looking forward to continuing uh, this webinar series in October. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.